Hi everyone, this is Oliver Lucanus from Below Water. Last year we made two popular videos about the fish in the lower Orinoco tributaries, close to the delta, and another about the fish on the Venezuelan side, close to the Guyana Shield. You can find links to these in the description. Today I want to show you a video from one of the rivers that drains into the Orinoco from the Llanos lowland. The Orinoco kind of curls around the Guyana Shield, and to the east of the giant river you can see the flat tabletop mountains on the horizon. The west side has the foothills of the Andes, but much further away from the river. Those eastern tributaries, like the ones in our video, are really short. Quite often there's a big waterfall at the top, and then the water flows in a straight line down to the Orinoco. The north, and then the west side of the Orinoco is totally different. This is the Orinoco Llanos region. Imagine the Llanos as a huge flat pan, a cookie sheet, that is ever so slightly tilted from the foothills of the Andes to the west towards the Orinoco in the east. Pour enough water on it and the whole thing will flood. And then slowly, when the rain stops, that water all recedes back to the Orinoco. When those rains start, all the fish from the Orinoco and the major rivers that drain the Llanos all travel out into those new habitats that are now full of aquatic plants. This is where many of the fish breed. We will have another video about this migration soon. Today, I want to look at the dry season. Now the Llanos is completely dry. The aquatic plants are gone, only their seeds survive in the dusty, sandy and flat substrate. And there's water only along the larger rivers that will drain all that water out when this huge flood pulse transforms this region again in the next rainy season. You can see a narrow strip of trees lining these permanent waterways. And in between there are these gigantic granite boulders. They look like huge bubbles of black top granite and it is quite easy to get up on top of them. In some places, there are lagoons that carry water for most of the year. So these rivers are not huge. They can have tea-stained water, and we already showed one of those rivers with peacock bass and wolffish in our predator pool video, but sometimes they are very clear, and I think this one is the perfect place to see cichlids. This river is close to the main branch of the Orinoco, and there's a diverse community of fish that live here. The first thing you will notice is that even in the dry season, when it has not rained in months, there is huge water flow here. The moment you step in the water, there are fish everywhere. And you can see that the water here is just knee deep. And under the first branch of wood, there's already a huge group of yellow festivums, Mesonauta insignis. We tend to associate these fish with slow moving water. But same as discus, they love strong currents. And when they are not breeding, they live in very large congregations of 30 or more fish. In the dry season, nearly every fish here is in a big school. You will see why soon, because there are plenty of predators here as well. This is a group of Hemiotis thyri. These slender and fast-moving fish really struggle against the huge current in this river. They look fantastic in a big school like this, and you can see why they are quite challenging to keep in the aquarium. Like the Bruconops jacopini with the little flag on their caudal fins swimming above them, these fish need a lot of oxygen. Of course, there are tons of small fish here, mostly close to the river bank, where they have more protection because of the root balls of the surrounding trees. If you want to see some of the small fish, check out the Rummy Nose video in the description. It is filmed in the same habitat. Today, I want to focus on cichlids and some of the medium and large sized fish that live here. These Crenicicla species Orinoco are everywhere. And as you may know, all of these huge pike cichlids have young that stay with their parents a full year until they breed again the next season. These are already 6 inches or 15 centimeters long, and we don't see mom in this clip, but she can't be far, because if they can stay together like this, it means they are still living at home. One of them actually measures up this Equidens supermaculatus, which is obviously way too big for him to eat, and it ignored the pike cichlid. Equidens are more rare in this habitat, usually solitary, they prefer the dense roots along the deep banks. Where fallen trees and branches slow down the current, beds of leaf litter accumulate, and many fish come into these areas to feed. There are shrimp, small catfish, and plenty of insect larvae in this leaf litter. Flagtails are super common in all of these places, like these Semiprocolotus cneri. If you watched our Predator Pool video or Orinoco 30 video, you'll have seen these big groups of them and maybe better understand why they're not that easy to keep. They need to be in these larger groups with plenty of space to do well and should be able to feed on detritus on the substrate throughout the day. 
If several larger trees have fallen across the river, the riverbed becomes more shallow. Then the white sand sort of builds up. And as always, the increased complexity of the bottom brings a greater diversity of fish. This is cover from the bigger predators, not just the fish, but we saw giant otters and caiman here, and of course tons of fishing birds like kingfishers, herons, and anhingas. By now you will have noticed the unsteady camera. The current here is actually so strong that I'm holding the camera with one hand and grabbing onto the branches with the other. The large schools of fish are nervous when they cross over these big fallen logs, so they travel at a faster speed than normal. Look closely and you will spot a pair and an individual chocolate cichlid, Hypsilicara corifenoides, down in the center of this tree crown. These are not really common here, they just occur in small numbers and prefer the more shaded places. The chocolates may very well be looking to breed under that branch, because that is the sort of place they will lay their eggs, even if this seems way too busy with too much through traffic. There is also an adult grey sausage pike, Crinicicla species Orinoco. It is certainly the least attractive of the big pikes, even if they look half decent when they are in courtship colors. This one travels alongside a school of the same size peacock bass, Cicla orinocensis. So you see why most of these small fish tend to stick to the riverbanks. There are many fish that could handle eating the mid-sized cichlids. We now also get to see our first earth eater, Satanoperca daemon, and the red severum, Heros liberifer. It is interesting that in this clear water we do not normally see any of the geophagus species. Closer to the mouth and in the turbid water of the Orinoco, which is not far from here, the beach seine nets were full of Geophagus dichrososter, abalius, and wine millery. Either they dislike this really clear water or this clean white sand is not their ideal feeding substrate. In the Orinoco, the sand is more muddy, with clay and a layer of bacterial mass holding together the surface. But let's look downstream. The water here is less clear and is starting to show the influence of the main river. The surrounding forest floor is no longer leaves on white silica sand, but thick mud with dense hair grass along the river and a lot of understory vegetation. The water is just a bit less clear in the river, and under this fallen tree there is a really nice mixed community with many of the cichlids we saw earlier. The pike cichlid are courting, and you can see that the female has the bright red eyes and pink belly. There are also leporinas here. These should be the spotted leporinus orthomaculatus and striped leporinus altipinus. Likely you notice that this whole community actually functions kind of well. The fish are overall similar in size, and while there are no rocks, there are plenty of territorial boundaries from fallen trees and branches, as well as deeper pools in the curves of the river, interrupted by beaches and shallow area. Leaving the camera under this log got the fish to move in closer, but they are still apprehensive. It takes time until they are really used to something new in their normal environment. This video captures most of the medium-sized cichlids, but there are plenty of smaller ones, such as several species of Apistogramma, Dicrosis, Crenicicla, and Letacara fulvipinis, but they are all in the riverbanks or more shallow water. The next log finally has a huge colony of Heros, alongside the Daemon and Mesonauta. When they are not breeding, their bellies are not so intensely red-colored. At this time of the year, when the water levels are low and the fish are crowded along these spots, we do not see the fish breeding at all. Only when the rain starts and the river goes over the banks and enters the surrounding forest, all of these fish will start to breed. If you want to see how other heros are breeding in the wild, check out our Rio Araguaia video. It is also mentioned in the description. I think everyone's favorite will be the Satanoperca daemon. And when they are feeding in the sand, the characins start to follow them to feed on small particles. It is curious that of all the fish we saw, many are of very uniform size. There were no smaller Satanoperca around, and at around 20 centimeters or 8 inches, these are already young adults. But they will get a bit bigger, eventually reaching around 30 centimeters or 12 inches. There is also a second Satanoperca in this region, but we did not see it at this location. During the day, you see almost no catfish here, but this Platydorus costatus or striped Raphael got spooked out of his log. These Raphaels and other Dorades are almost never seen during the day. They are really nocturnal fish. 
Once their hiding place is compromised, they will swim upstream and disappear in the next suitable dark place or jam themselves into the root balls of the trees. You will also see a Hippostomus first sitting in front of his tunnel, excavated from the mud and clay of the riverbank, and then suddenly disappearing in his burrow. In most places that have Hippostomus, that is their typical behavior. The mouth of the river is actually a bit spooky. It kind of forms this T intersection and the current pushes you out with the clear water and suddenly you don't see the bottom anymore because the main river is much deeper and the same time the visibility drops and you don't see the branches of the fallen trees until you swim into them. This area has completely different fish. Even the tetras in the shallows are different and there are suddenly plenty of piranhas, pakus and brycon in the open water. While there were no rays in the clear river, there were plenty in the muddy substrates of this area. I hope you enjoyed this video. We are working on a new website where people can purchase the books directly. My book Amazon Below Water has been out since 2009 and if you'd like to buy a copy, write me an email from belowwater.com while we work on a proper e-commerce site for people to order. Thanks for watching. Make sure to share this video and I hope you subscribe to our channel.